Tonight we're going to do volume three of the Nook Chat, and it's going to be on the early schools of the Everson area. And uh, my wife, uh, Inez, is here because she was a student in a school that was built in 1906 as a one-room school. It was a two-room school when she went there, but uh, she uh, went through all eight grades in this little school called Glen Echo that still exists as a building. Well, a couple of uh, interesting uh, points is uh, Don Rackendiver, who will be our lead speaker next month, and my wife used to ride the school bus together when they went to Mount Baker for two years. Yeah. And they both remember each other from the school bus, and they haven't seen each other in probably That's right. 20, 30 years, maybe more than that. Probably more. And with Don, this is funny, because they, to open the door, there was a uh, handle, and you sat behind that little rod. <laughs> And yes. Who opened the door then? Don Reichenberg did. did. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, a question came up about some of the other schools, and I neglected that, I'm sorry. But Roeder was a school just south of Everson across the river. And uh, Victor Roeder uh, was a homesteader in that area, and he built a log uh, school. Uh, many people from Rotor will argue this with me, but he built a log, little log school next to the river across from the Nolte's on the Nolte Road. And the river took that one out. The river washed that one out. So they built a new one up on the hill, and the new one up on the hill is called the Old Rotor School, and it is now part of the auction barn. Mm -hmm. And it's still there, pretty much intact, I've been told. I haven't been in there for 20 years, but... The school is still is pretty much intact, just like the the Glen Echo school is pretty much intact. Uh, Roeder, uh, it's interesting. In uh, his sister wrote the compendium uh, called Whatcom History, uh, leather bound books that, uh, in 1926, and her uh, total description of her brother was he came back from school, business school, and he took up and got interested in real estate in the Nooksack area and then he came to Bellingham and she tells all about the stuff he did in Bellingham but while he was in Nooksack he had a post office, a rooming house, a store, got married, had children, homesteaded the largest homestead in the area, or had the largest farm in the area, built a school and for her there was none of that mentioned in the uh, Whatcom County history. Uh, about her own brother. So you see, even the history books don't have it all. Another, uh, I mentioned Tymon. Uh, there was another school uh, south of, of Roeder called Forest Grove. And most people don't even know that there ever was a Forest Grove. On the old maps, you can see that there is a railroad spur running in from the railroad track to an area along the Noon Road and that was the Forest Grove Mill. Well, the mill workers uh, lived very near there. As a matter of fact, they had a, 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 a community of small buildings that mostly bachelors lived in, but most of the bachelors eventually got married and had children, and some of them lived in there, and they built the Forest Grove School. And, uh, and there also, I found out just uh, two weeks ago when I was looking through the records of the old uh, Nooksack Methodist Church, there was a Forest Grove Methodist Church there at the same time. I don't know if it met in the schoolhouse or where they had another building. But those are two things that uh, I haven't researched yet because they were outside my research area and I really didn't have time to go every place. Can you talk about the South Pass School? The South Pass School was up beyond, about six miles, I would say, up beyond uh, uh, Glen Echo. There was some, where Ted Deem lived uh, up on top of the hill, and there were a few families up beyond that. Wester Green was here early. Uh, he's one of the original uh, homesteaders in the area. Nice story about him is when he moved, uh, that is probably 10 miles in from the crossing, he packed his iron, cast iron 
cooking stove on his back at 10 miles into his homestead. So he had a stove in his cabin in the homestead. And of course, West Greens are up there. When that little valley they settled, uh, they developed a school called the South Pass School, which of course, primarily were West Greens and their relatives. But uh, those people, again, they had to walk to school. So Glen Echo was too far away. So they had their little school up there. And uh, I think that pretty well covers the schools that were close by. Any other questions? Did Taxi, Reg? Did, did Tuxedo have a school? Tuxedo never had a school. Tuxedo, this is my son back here, he happens to know about Tuxedo because my great-grandfather had a post office from 1886 to 1890 and he named it Tuxedo. And so when my mother was born, she, uh, in 1900, she put down Tuxedo as her birthplace. And I went to college up here for 17 year quarters, and every quarter I had to explain to them that my mother's maiden name was Berg, and her married name was Berg, and that she, Tuxedo was a community that preceded Nooksack. <laughs> but it seems that the students at Western never fully understood that those kind of things could happen. I had to explain it every quarter. Another connection is that uh, my wife uh, family housed a teacher whose two daughters are here tonight. And they're sitting on my right here. And uh, they had never met each other before tonight. So Little Nook Jack is uh, getting, uh, it's N-O-O-K-C-H-A-T is uh, connecting people that were never connected before. If, if you ladies felt like sharing the story of how your mother uh, arrived here, that'd be interesting to hear a little bit about that. There you go. Well, we're a little, we're a hold, little, hold, 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 hold it up close. Oh, hold up close, okay. We're a little blurry about that. Her, uh, she went to Bellingham Normal, and so it, was, it took two years to get her teaching degree then. Now Western, yeah. Yeah, it's now Western. And um, I believe from Bellingham Normal, she came yeah, to 1925. Yeah, 1925 26. and 26. Those two Where school did she years. live before? She, she was came, in Bellingham. They, she she came, she's a Bellingham girl. Yes, she, she was a Bellingham to, girl. She went to Rotor School. Rotor School. <laughs> Bellingham. Her father was a conductor on the tram that went through Fairhaven. Ah. And so he passed away when she was a teenager. And she, you know, she needed to get a job right away to help support her mother. So. So then she went to school after she. And then, so she taught for two years in Glen Echo, and she then went she went down to. Let's see. I think she went to Toppenish after that. Oh. She and her mother moved to Toppenish, and then she went back to the University of Washington and got, you know, took two more years of school, so that she had a four years. Then she's stayed as a teacher. Yep. Taught in Seattle at John Marshall Junior High School until she retired when she was 65. Obviously so got married someplace. Like married. <laughs> she went. When she got married, teachers couldn't get married, and so she married my father secretly. They were secretly married for three, three years, three years, four years. One time they had gone way, way up into British Columbia. You know, they... The only time that they would be together would when they could, you know, get away for a holiday, and they would always go far away so that they wouldn't run into anybody. And sure enough, she ran into one of the main gossips at her school. <laughs> in the hotel. In the, yeah, hotel. in the hotel. <laughs> so we always celebrated two wedding anniversaries in our family. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Fond memories of Glen Echo. Yes, very fond memories of Glen Echo and, and, and staying um, with Inez's family. She loved it. And she would talk about going back to visit Mabel. You know, she would come, she would come back. Doris. Doris Myers. Yeah. Another story that uh, my mother would shoot me for telling, but anyhow, <laughs> she, she had what we call a, today a nervous breakdown. And when she was a senior, in uh, in uh, high school, and she had the romantic lead in the annual school play, and uh, she rose from her deathbed and did an amazing performance as a romantic lead in this uh, school play, and then went back to bed. 
And as a result, she didn't finish high school. And uh, I never knew this until many years later because she went to work in, in the bank. They had built a bank in Nooksack in, by, in, by, 1920, by 1920. And uh, she went to work in the bank. And a year later, the principal at Nooksack said, if anybody can keep a job for a year, they should have a high school diploma. So she got her high school diploma, but she never finished high school. In those days, things were a little, little more lax than they are now. But uh, I don't think my mother cared whether she had a high school diploma or not. But uh, now my dad would, would have it would have been important too. But mom, I never knew that until later on. That uh, I didn't know that she hadn't. She had spent two years in the eighth grade, and I didn't know she had uh, not ever graduated with her class. Is that what would be be called the high school equivalency today? Well, uh, my mother, my mother in the eighth the grade, GED. one of the or no, when she was a senior in high school, maybe this is before she had her nervous breakdown. The boys, there were five boys in her class, and they were the boys' basketball team. And they went off during the school day to play a basketball game someplace. And she decided there was no sense in the girls going to school if the boys weren't going to school. <laughs> and so one day the principal found that there were no senior students in school. They didn't have to even look. They just drove over to my mother's home and there were all the girls. And they were told to go back to school and they were going to get one great point docked on all their grades and they were maybe not going to be allowed to graduate. Well, needless to say, they got their grades restored and they did graduate. But uh, my mother had a little problem with she always thought that things should keep moving. And if they were getting a little dull, then it was her job to get them moving again. Like the father. Like Jim, they, like his mother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mischievous. No, that's the thing. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it got me thinking when Ines was describing the principal twirling the kids around and how things have changed uh, these days. I don't think you'd find the principal interacting physically like that. I'm curious about uh, punishment and discipline and things like that. Uh, was uh, it as strict as I might imagine? or? Uh, it depends on what you talk about. Uh, if you uh, violated something that was assumed to be uh, a standard, then you got disciplined and you got paddled. Every every school used a paddle. In grade school, they paddled. Go tell. Um, Leroy Morningstar was his name. And he, it was Leroy Morningstar, Grandpa's boy because he stayed with Grandpa, because his parents were gone. But he oh. did a prank, but he got paddled in mm -hmm. school. I mean, when, I mean, he crawled underneath the legs, and everyone paddled him as he was crawling. So in the gauntlet, he had a gauntlet he had to go through. So that was, and I felt And you remember so she said, mentioned about the boy having his mouth washed out for saying bad words. And, uh, but I know in this Everson School picture, I uh, mentioned that on Saturday that the room above the main staircase, the second story, was known as Clint's paddling room. Clint McBeth, many people will remember, was a very well-known person here in this community. And uh, he was, at that time, the Everson coach. He was a guy that came to Nooksack with these people in these uniforms and uh, but he uh, if you went to the principal's office uh, even when I was in school in the 40s late 40s uh, there was a paddle there and uh, you were paddled and usually you could hear the paddle uh, meeting its target and you often there was uh, some repercussion from the mouth of the person being paddled. It wasn't uh, a light tap, it was something you would remember. When I was a little kid back in Pennsylvania, I thought if you went to the principal's office, you never came back. And then I didn't find out until years later that my little, my big sister 
used to go there and come back. <laughs> and, but I never went there. I got as far as the cloakroom, but I never got as far as the principal's office because I knew that was the end. <laughs> but print, it was, and that was expected, you know. But how many uh, you know, schools would allow children to jump off the school, uh, the woodshed and knock themselves out? And there's also the outhouses, you know. Uh, the things happened around the outhouse that uh, weren't necessarily uh, apropos. And these, uh, so it was different. But the uh, the it was one of the boys going barefooted at, at recess, they I mean, we, they wouldn't allow that now. And they'd get dirty, and uh, it, it was just much different. But you know, now they they're not allowed to play dodgeball anymore. How much fun we had playing dodgeball. <laughs> so, other question. Rach? Uh, I'd just like to ask Inez what her most favorite parts of the school day were and, and the least favorite parts of the school day. Most favorite and least favorite. Me? <laughs> <laughs> you see where I get this humor, huh? With my students. Have you? My college girls. No, no. No, no. no. What, so. At Glen Echo, what was your most favorite thing at Glen Echo? Teacher. Teacher. What was your least favorite thing? I, I'd have to think. She liked school real well, so I it, like it, it wasn't. The, she didn't have very much that she didn't like. And my mom housed teachers, so I was, you know, just one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you may, most of you don't know, but she went on in 1958 to start a college rooming house for girls, and she's now housed over 600 college girls from Western in her house. And I used to cook for them. And she cooked for them, and she did their washing for them. And, and I was uh, pregnant. <laughs> and she was pregnant, and uh, and the thing I remember her stories about, she was their mother. Most of these girls, especially in the early 50s and the late 50s, most of these girls had never been away from home, and uh, they didn't know anything. Many of them didn't know how to cook. Some of them didn't know how to make their bed. They thought she was going to make their bed for them. Uh, I do their laundry. I did their laundry. Yeah. There, there was many situations that she had, but she became the surrogate mother for hundreds of girls, and, and she's had four or five of the girls got married in the house, and uh, she was the first babysitter of a couple of her students, and uh, it, it, she had a very interesting time in schooling. Now, I didn't have quite a, as fun time with school as she did. But I started out with boys. I had boys in my house, and I decided I was going to change and cook. Boys couldn't afford it, yeah. so that's when I changed to girls. <laughs> but I had 24 girls at a time that I cooked for and did laundry and cried with them. <laughs> That's why she got 600 girls in the house. Plus, she, it probably worked out better because she had four of her daughters. So it was probably better that she had girl students than boy students. <laughs> but of course, she didn't lose her boy students either because she had been living in a house before she moved into the boarding house, and so she rented the boys her house. And so they moved from, from their boarding house into her former house. residence. And she had they were friends for all four years they were in school. But they were all good kids. I think if you trust them, you get more out of them. I trusted them. So she's had a lot of a lot of history in education. Thank you, that was great.